Is there a stack of books that I can have, maybe? That I could uh, just, yeah, that could, yeah, that could have them high. You want them to be high. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thanks. That's great. Perfect. Excellent. Perfect. I'm sorry, you're not set up. Don't even worry about it. Okay. That's fine. That's fine. Perfect. Okay. Thank you everyone for coming tonight. I want to give a special shout out to Meir Joslet who was responsible to help organize it. Thank you so much. And to Miriam Fulman for graciously uh, donating her house for the evening. Um, we're going to go into a very nice discussion tonight. The Torah values greatly the role of a Jewish woman in her home and how she builds it. Tonight's discussion will be just to give that kind of chizik and strength and to give everyone an opportunity to understand how to better beautify and, ma and magnify the glory of their home. A little bit about me. I was trained as an orthopedic surgeon. I practiced for 30 years. I was a Talmud Muvuk of one of the great rabbis of the 20th century, Ravigda Miller, who I knew since I was 12 years old. And I really didn't make a move without him. I got to learn a lot about human relations. I was in practice for many years. I learned in Chaim Berlin 12 years half a day, and then I would practice. Um, I decided to relocate to Miami Beach in 2002, where I helped the local synagogue set up a pirche, because I had set up that for, I'd run that for about 15 years for another kollel in Brooklyn that I'd started with a few friends of mine. And um, I was quickly tapped to teach at the University of Miami, Feisha Torah or Sameach, where many, many people came to our house every Friday night. Many people we sent off to Eretz Yisrael, and so you get a little bit of a feeling for dating in that department. I moved back to New York, Dafka, just for Shaduchim, to ensure that my children, my daughters especially, would have the right kind of chasanim that I was looking for. And then from there, I taught in many yeshivas at night, especially in dating and Shalom Bayis. I retired from my work in about six years ago, and I've been devoted exclusively to dating in Shalom Bayis, and today I'm on the phone or seeing people literally 10, 11, 12 hours a day. She could tell you I'm a hard man to reach. Uh, and Sabah uh, Hashem, trying to do as much as I can in this area. And thank God, close, I mean, I'm not, I didn't make them all, but I have had my hand in about maybe 1,200 Shaduchim, 34 just in the Corona era, from March to July, where I helped fa facilitate a lot of them. And a nice fair amount of people are on dates tonight. So thank God. I'll take that water and then we'll get started. Forgive me. Okay, let's get moving. So, in 1964, Rav Zell Pliskin writes, he's a great author, that he read a poem that was written by Riliahu Dessler, who was one of the great Musser giants of the 20th century. And I think this is what I want to focus on today. I want to start tonight's... Uh, presentation with this thread. The past is only memories. The future is but only hopes. Focus on the present, for that is where your life really is, and it consists only of tests. He memorized the poem and he says he constantly reviews it in his head because we have to focus on our lives as being one day at a time. Your life challenge is to appreciate all that you have in your present state of affairs. Your life challenge is to experience more joy and simcha in your present feel and Torah study, it should make you happy. Judaism is about joy. It's not a monotonous, boring religion. It's not being taught right to you. It's got to be something that, that talks to you. There's a joy to Judaism. Your life challenge is to become a more kinder, more compassionate person and to experience more joy from the good that you do while doing it. Your life's challenge is to constantly develop your character traits in the present. So our mission is to choose wiser, thoughts, wiser words, and wiser actions in our day-to-day in our -day affairs. And as a result, bring more meaning to our lives. Don't waste 
an excessive amount of time on regrets about the past. Keep climbing and elevating yourself. It's all about growth. When I deal with uh, singles, which I do often throughout the day, one of the key things that I look for is I'm asking them, are you growing? That's the key. Are you growing? Are you, is your bar going in north, in an upward climb? Keep connecting with Hashem. Keep doing good in this world. Our life's journey will be more elevated when we continue to develop a sense of who we are and what our image is all about. So let me start with a beautiful story that Rabbi Waxman from Muncie says. It's a very interesting story. He says he has friends who are getting ready to marry off their son. And so three weeks prior to the wedding, he developed a blemish on his face. The mother was aghast. She says, we can't send you down the aisle looking like this. So she did her research on Google and found the best cosmetol cosmetic dermatologist on the Upper East Side. And she made an appointment for her son, who was a nice, good Ben Torah. So he walks into the office, the waiting room of this well-known, supposedly well-known dermatologist. And he sits down in the waiting room and he has his Gemara and he's, you know, not letting his time go idle. When suddenly a pop star, as he calls her, more, uh, uh, an, uh, an idol of depravity, walks in with yellow hair, and everyone is like idolizing her in the, in the waiting room and saying, wow, did you see who walked in? Did you see who walked in? Meanwhile, so someone gives this young boy a shove. and goes, look who walked in. He goes, I have no clue who she is. So suddenly, they, now they spin the, the, the conversation that they're talking about him. What a greenhorn. He doesn't know anything. Could you imagine he doesn't know who she is? And now the word spills out behind the, the, the counter to the doctor's staff and eventually gets to the doctor. So when it's time for him to go see the physician and he's brought into the room, the treatment room, he says, ah, oh, so I hear from your mother you're getting married soon. Another one of those orthodox, uh, you know, set up and matches in Shaduchim, he says, says, yeah. He says, you guys don't know the first thing about getting married. You don't know what life is. You got to get with the times. This guy was not an idiot, this young man. He says to him, Doctor, before you give me any advice, can, you, can I ask you a question? She said, sure. How many times have you been married? He says, five. He says, you have nothing to teach me. Thank you so much. And the lesson here is the Torah gives us advice for everything in life, how to go and navigate through life beautifully. We have it all. We just have to tap into it. And we'll do that a little bit tonight. Okay. A true or false quiz we're going to take. Number one, husbands and wives have to give and take equally for a marriage to succeed. Answer, false. The more women receive graciously from their husbands and focus on their own happiness, the more successful the marriage will be. And this is a very, very important point that I want to hit on right now. So I'm going to skip to it. Forgive me. I'm going to skip to it because I want to quote an interesting article that I saw last year and actually in the Tubav edition of Ami magazine. But actually, I'm going to read you something that Shalom Arush wrote about this concept of mashpia and mekabel. A woman needs to learn how to receive. Alpiya Torah Kedosha, according to the Holy Torah, Hazacha Nikra Mashpia, the man is the giver, Vanekeva Mekabelis, and the woman is the receiver. When the husband does his role and carries out his mission to be the giver, to give the woman honor, ahava warmth, yachastov, a warm feeling, to fill all her needs. Now he's considered a male. However, when he wants to be the receiver and he complains, she doesn't honor me, she doesn't do this, she, he's, I want you to do this for me, I want you to do that for me, he wants to flip the tables on her. She has to give me honor, she has to give me cover. Now we have an, a female. And now we have worse. We have two women in the house. This is what creates arguments, foments all kinds of trouble. Because the woman is seeking the honor that's naturally, that she's expecting to get. He's not giving her the honor. According to his twisted logic, she has to honor me. So he has to insist on getting his honor. And he annoys her, and he's not nice with it about it, and he constantly slams her for not giving him this and giving him that. He degrades her and he He destroys and he's trespassing of all the laws of Shalom Ba'is. Because the idea is the man must be the giver and the woman needs to be the receiver. So they interviewed Rav Manus Friedman last year for the Tuba Av edition of Ami and he said some really nice things here. The foundation of marriage has to be has the concept of Mashpia and the Makabal. If the man isn't the Mashpia, he destroys the Makabal who is the receiver. 
If the wife isn't receiving, it just about kills him. He has to be the one who gives, while his wife has to be able to rely on him and look up to him. One of the things that I teach people, they always ask me all the time, how do I know if I'm dating the right one? How do I know? So I tell them there's a simple rule called the pair test. P-A-I-R. P is physical attraction. A is admiration. I is emotional intimacy. And R is respect. Do you admire him? I ask the girls, do you see midos in him that you didn't see in other people that you married? And you look up to him. So we have, she has to admire him. So, he, so they ask them, even women that are secular will go for this concept of being the macabre, people who are new age women. And he says, even new age women? Yes, I guess you're like, why didn't anyone tell us this before? Even the world wants to know about this. And he says like this, they ask him, where do you find such a guy? A Bacha once told me that he had met a girl who impressed him so much, but something was stopping him from proposing. He didn't know what it was, but it was causing him to hesitate. I know, I said, he tells him, she's smart, right? She's good, yeah? She's very capable. Why does she need you? How, how will you be the mashpia? Of course you can't marry her. Because she has it all. She can't be a receiver. She's always be, being the giver. So she has to be able to receive. I just have to check my camera for one second. Yeah, we're good. Okay. So that's key. The first thing we have to understand is what is a mashpia? A mashpia is not a dictator. A mashpia can't be a dictator, because then the macabre won't be able to be, to able to be macabre. In case like that, you're not giving, you're just dominating. And that's why chasan dome le melech, a melech is elected. A Moshe rules. We don't believe in that in Judaism. You don't rule. And he says here, that's the only issue in most of the problems that we see today in Shalom Bayis. And it's something we have to really click in on. What does it mean to be a mashpia? Now, Let's go on to the next question. Men tend to be less mature than women, which is one reason women end up taking on more housework and child-rearing responsibilities. Answer, false. Well, women take on more responsibility because they're afraid it won't be done the right way, their way. Four, women have more influence than men on whether a relationship will be connected and fun or, or distant or miserable. True. Women are the keepers of the relationship and have much more power over the culture in their home. And that's key. It's very important to know that. Five, wives who are always saying what they want are more likely to get divorced. False. The more you express your desires, the more your husband knows how to make you happy. You gotta communicate. That's very important. Six, a happy, no, I'm sorry. When you've been married for a while, you can pretty much predict what your partner is going to say in any given situation. False. We'd like to think we can read our husband's minds, but it's simply not so. Eight. A husband wants his wife to be happy and will go to great lengths to make sure she is. Eight. True. Ask any married man and he'll tell you so. And we'll, sit, we'll talk about that tonight. That men really want to make sure that their wives are happy. It means a lot to them. Nine. If something your husband is doing is bothering you, it's best to be honest and say so directly. False. You don't have to suffer indefinitely, but criticism has a chilling effect on marriage. Criticism is just acidic. And there's always a better way to get what you want than to be critical. 10. Happy wives tell their husbands when they want more attention or affection. False. Happy wives are always liked by their husbands, don't need to ask for attention or affection because their husbands are drawn to them. Feeling that you need to ask is a sign that you're forgotten. 11. If your husband grew up in a dysfunctional family, it may take him years to learn to be emotionally supportive, take initiative, or respond. False. You'll notice an improvement if you just take on this new role of being a receiver. You wouldn't have married him if he didn't have qualities you admire. Just feel confident about yourself. One of the things I tell girls when they go on dates is they have to demonstrate assurance, self-assurance. It's not ego, God, we're going to talk about that tonight, but it's a self-confidence. Marriages where the wife is feminine and the husband is masculine are highly successful. Absolutely true. Very important not to reverse those roles. What happens when a woman goes to work and is in a very uh, responsible position in, in giving orders and demanding and if she becomes more like the man, it becomes problematic. She has to remain and maintain that masculinity. Next. Once your marriage is in a crisis, you're separated or there's been an infidelity, it's probably late, too late to save it. 
false. No matter what kind of crisis your marriage is in, it can likely be completely revitalized, becoming the best it's ever been. We never give up, ever. Try not to, at least. This is beautiful. Couples with happy marriages have learned how to fight fear. False! There's no such thing as a fighting fear. There's no such thing as fighting. We don't want that, right? Because any fighting hurts any individual, hurts a person. We don't want that. Couples with happy marriages should not have to fight. No one, want, no one signs up for an okay relationship. No one gets married because they don't have enough hard work already. You made a decision to get married because you want to love and be loved, to have a sense of family. But most, sometimes some couples struggle with a, with a divorce every 13 seconds in the United States and more unhappy marriages limping along. Many people are simply not succeeding. Like anyone else worthwhile in life, a happy relationship takes some skill. So tonight we're going to get into some of those skills and I want to share some of those thoughts with you tonight. But first, I want to tell over an amazing story. Rabbi Cheskel Sarna, the Rosh Yeshiva and Meshkiach of Hebron, which is one of the best yeshivas in, in Israel, my son-in-law went, uh, went to learn there, was asked to speak at the bris of a shared grandson of Rav Moshe Hebroni and the Gera Rabbi. Imagine, a skion of a big literature yeshiva married, the grandson of the, of the Rosh Yeshiva of Hebron married the, the, the granddaughter of the Gera Rabbi. Very interesting how these two came together. This occasion was celebrated by prominent families and attended by many of the Torah giants of Eretz Yisrael, including inside the audience were descendants of the Chafetz Chaim, the altar of Slobodka, the, Chaz- the altar of Navarak, the Vizhnitzer and Gera Hasidic dynasties, and many others. During his address, listen to what he said. Rabbi Sarna made the following remarkable statement. Everyone in this room believes that his grandfather did the most for Klai in the last hundred years. And yes, you all could make a case for that. The Chavetz Chaim, the Altar of Nevada, the Altar of Sabatka, and many, had all, many Talmidim and had established many prominent yeshivas. Right? So did the Hasidic courts that were represented at this bris. I'm here to tell you that it's none of you that did the most for Klaus in the last hundred years. And everyone in the room gasped. I'll tell you even more. The one who did the most for Klai in the last hundred years never learned the Blat Gemara. Now the audience was spellbound. Where is he going with this? I'll tell you even more. When I mention the name of this person, you'll all agree with me that this individual did the most for the Jewish people in the last hundred years, and we wouldn't be around if we didn't have this person. Everyone in the room smiled and agreed, and he answered, Sarashnir was the legendary founder of the Beis Yaakov movement. A seamstress from Krakow, she observed how many Jewish girls were no longer interested in preserving the heritage of Yiddishkeit, being lured by the magnetic pull of the secular Haskalah revolution. By the way, if you want to see a great video on the subject, last week, the night of Tishavav, I presented a phenomenal concept, a phenomenal presentation of what created the Holocaust. The whole, how the Haskalah movement destroyed the, all the Eastern European communities. It was based on my Rebbe's book called Divine Madness with Victor Miller. It's on Torah anytime. Can die to watch it. I give a whole historical background as to how the, what created the Holocaust and how Hashem's, you know, chilling prophecies in Chumash came true. Could I look at it? With the support and blessing of great Torah leaders, including the Chafetz Chaim and the Gera Rebbe, Sarashnir created a network of schools to educate young Jewish women. These schools inculcated their students with Torah values and an appreciation of who studies Torah and motivated them to teach others what they learned. She created a whole pyramid scheme of teaching people who taught others, but more than that, she taught them what, what it means to study Torah and what it means to support a husband who's studying Torah. Without her efforts, it would have been impossible for the Jewish nation to survive. Therefore, without any kind of hesitation, she did the most for the Jewish people in the last hundred years. No man can rival what she did, not even up to her ankles. What creates our problems today? So I, one of the things that I see that creates crises in dating and marriage is something called ego is the enemy. Ego. Ego. Right? You're brimming with ambition. You're young now. You've made some money. You feel comfortable about yourself. And now wherever you are, whatever you're doing, the worst enemy that already lives inside you, you. It's called your ego. Not me, you think. No one would ever call me an egomaniac. 
perhaps you always thought of yourself as a pretty balanced person, but for people with ambition, talent, drive, which probably describes all of us, ego comes with the territory. Precisely what makes us so promising as thinkers and, and creatives and doers, what drives us to the top of, the, of those fields, makes us vulnerable to the darker side of this horrible mida. The ego that we have most, comply, most commonly goes by a more casual definition. An unhealthy belief in our own importance. And all of us fall prey to this. And this is sometimes what gets in the way of a relationship and could drive a wedge through it. Self-centered feelings. That's the definition. It's that child inside every person that's a little petulant. The one that chooses getting his or her way over anything or anyone else. And unfortunately, could be driving the, the, the bar of more and more of the divorces that we see today. Slavi Youngreis writes the following, Reverend Youngreis' daughter, she says, one of the reasons, she says, I can be at parties and I see a phenomenon that really disturbs me. And someone, a woman will come up to her to talk with her and she'll say to her, it's okay, I can replace him, there are other men. What happened? What happened to the belief that there was a concrete concept to what it meant to, what it meant to, be, to be married? And people could just dismiss that today. It's horrible. When, it, when the notion of ourselves and the world grows so inflated that it begins to distort the reality, it can have horrible, horrible consequences on our marriages. Just move along. I don't need this right now. So, I want to share that story with them now. They're going to enjoy it. A woman writes, I hesitate to tell this story because it hurts so much. It contains details that I prefer to forget and certainly not to publicize. But I know it also contains a message that I mustn't keep to myself because the number of women are going the way I did is growing all the time. She lives in Eretz Yisrael. I come from a traditional family. Initially, we're not from, but since my parents sent us all to wonderful religious schools, we became from family. The kids helped drive the tshuva in that home. As an exceptionally good girl, I was a little tzaddikis, and I stayed the way, that way as I grew up. I'm telling you the truth, and I'm going to tell the truth about what came later, though it hurts me badly and it pains me. I married a Bentora from a fine firm family. We both had high aspirations to build a home solidly based on Torah and to raise our children accordingly. We were so pure and so innocent. We had six children closely spaced. My husband was a model husband. I was a model wife. He was the king in our home. I was the queen. We would sit and learn halacha together. We were devoted to each other's needs. And together we were devoted to our children. For 10 years it was like that. But we needed money. And I found a job with a company that pays a decent salary. Some of the women who worked there were religious, others were not. For the first month or so, I focused on working on my paycheck and nothing more. I just went in, I did my job, and went home. And then Esther came into my life. And look how insidious that influence can be. Esther was a non-religious woman in her 50s, a kind soul who apparently seemingly couldn't hurt a fly. She was like the mother to all the young women in the office. She had no children of her own. In fact, she never married. And she lavished all her maternal warmth on people like us. Esther found a place in my heart. I became good friends with her. And don't ask me how, but she drew me into her circle, her world. Not that she preached against religion. She wasn't a from woman. She simply told me about her life. And it wasn't that her life was exotic or glamorous, but little by little it influenced my worldview. I have to point out something, the woman writes. In high, my high school years, I had girls like this in Beis Yaakov, but I knew what they were up to. So my defenses were up. I was careful. I had no problem resisting because I knew I had to be guard, on guard against such girls who had certain influences in their lives, not as from. But now the enticement was coming from a woman who could have been my mother and my defenses were just not up. Why would I put up a guard against someone who looked and acted like she was a typical safta? After a couple of years of this, my Ashkafis became completely eroded. Secular books, music, and movies became part of my life. I would spend hours discussing this material with Esther at home. I continued playing my role robotically, but no longer with the same pure-hearted dedication that I had when I first got married. I had turned into a two-faced woman. One day, my husband happened to notice songs on my iPod, 
that were not to his liking. He was shocked. Such things were not part of the life we had built together as a firm family. I reacted with the most effective defense. It's my life. Don't tell me what to do. What happened to her? She metamorphosized into a completely different individual. I attacked him back. In the course of that argument, all my new opinions came rushing out like a, like a geyser, like a dam breaking. I'll do what I please. No one's going to tell me what to do, she said to her husband. Only his stunned expression alerted me to the fact that such words had never been used by, between both of us. From there, things got worse. I told Esther what happened at home, and she said to me, she gave me advice, how to put my husband in his place. My husband was completely baffled. It was as if someone had taken the combination of the safe of his wife and made me completely inaccessible. He didn't know what had gotten into me. He couldn't even talk to me. A year of fighting wore down the bond we nurtured so carefully for years. One day, like that, I packed up, took the children, and moved back with my parents. Eventually, after the painful arbitration, we finalized our divorce. That quick! It was amazing. We were to share the custody of the kids. After that, there was a period of tension with all sorts of power games. My emotions were in a tangle. I soon realized that the children were suffering from my attitude, and then once I saw that, I managed to calm down and make peace with my reality. He started a new household and we married, and things settled down, but I entered a phase of my life that I would give any amount of money in the world if I could erase it. Welcome to the world of single parenting. You never want to go there. Believe me. If you have any alternative, don't go there. Don't, I won't elaborate. I'll just say that thousands of divorced women are going around today in a terrible state socially, spiritually, and financially. Most of the new friends I met initiated their own divorces, as I had. And in most cases, the husband did not want to get divorced. A respected Dayan told me he issues many gets that our readiness to choose divorce a second, shows us today what's going on. That it's a new, it's a new uh, epidemic. And she says, and she writes that she wishes she had never gone that far. Anyway, she went into a more liberal lifestyle, having friends, going out, let's not go there. And she would have, she would share, as she, she shared custody with the, the, the husband. He had three more kids of, of his own from his second wife, and sometimes she would dump the six kids on his new wife and go out, whatever. One day, this new wife got sick, and she contracted the terminal cancer. And so now she couldn't take care of her three, and now she, the first wife found, him, found herself taking care of all the kids. And after several years of chemotherapy, she said to her, I need to speak to you. So the first wife came up, and she was with one of her sons. She says, can you wait for me downstairs? She says, I know my time, the, new, the wife who was suffering from cancer, is, gonna, is coming up soon. I'm not going to be around very long. For the good of my husband and the good of the children, I'd like for you to remarry him. A, a wife knows her husband really well, and I know that he's never forgotten the wife of his youth, his Aishas Neurim. Please remarry him. I'm not going to be around much longer after I leave this world. It's important to make sure that you know the truth, that it's my honest wish, and I'm going to write it in my will. I didn't answer her. I couldn't. I was overwhelmed by her graciousness and nobility. And I embraced her for a long time, murmuring words of appreciation. The next week, we received the news that she had returned her soul to her Creator. I attended the Levaya, and during the Shiva, I provided meals for my husband and all nine kids. After the Shloshim, a messenger came from Bastin, a rabbi that we both knew, and he told me that the deceased had written in her will that she'd like her husband to marry his first wife again. I started to cry. I told him that I already knew about this. She spoke to me shortly before she passed away. He was astonished that I even knew about it. And I told him the answer is yes, emphatically yes. I decided to be straightforward about my intentions. I already paid a high enough price for ego games. We just spoke about ego. I know it sounds strange, but after I had a few dates with my former husband, we talked about what happened and we closed the door in the past. I wanted to tell him about the spiritual low point that I had hit, that I had fallen to. But he didn't want to hear about it. He only wanted to know, can you go back to being the woman you used to be? 
The wife I remembered. We remarried, my husband fulfilling the rare mitzvah of remarrying the woman he had once divorced. Now years later we've united, blended family, nine children, three of them married. One might say that the wound has been sewn up and healed, yet for me the scar remains. And that's how it has to be, because I'm not willing to forget what I went through. I need to hold on to that reminder how much a person has to guard himself in order to stay on the path that their soul truly desires. And to be very careful with the and repercussions of who influences them in their life. Okay, let's skip. Hmm. In Parshas Baaloscha, we observe a tragic decline in Amisro's respect for Hashem and Moshe Rabbeinu. There's a litany of complaints. A litany of complaints. And Moshe says, I can't take it anymore. Hashem, what am I supposed to be? Their mother? I can't, I can't do it. From where, what am I supposed to do? Moshe Rabbeinu is clearly at a loss. Parenting or, is never easy. He didn't want, it, didn't want the job anymore. What was it about that time that said to Moshe, enough's enough? And the answer is like this. Why couldn't he handle the nation's complaints? Because he was an ish tov. In that parsha, he says to his Yisrael, his father-in-law, come with us to Eretz Yisrael. We just left Mitzrayim, and he says, "Vehaya hatov ahu, asher yitiv Hashem v'imanu v'itanu v'itavnu lach." Five times he says the word "tov." The point I want to make is, if we're complainers in life, we're going to have problems. We can't complain. We have to take the cue from Moshe Rabbeinu that he saw all only the good, and we have to frame our requests, right, as not a complaint, but I'd rather have this. It's important how we, we, we talk and we ask for things. Moshe Rabbeinu teaches us that complaining doesn't help relationships, certainly doesn't help marriages. What we have to learn from Moshe Rabbeinu is everything is, see it from the perspective of Tov. So one of the things I tell all my singles that I deal with is I want you, this is what I do every day that I've been doing for years, please write down 50 things that you're grateful for and please say it after Shachas every day. Start your day with a gratitude seder. It's so important. It changes my whole perspective. I've been doing this for over 15 years. One of the greatest things I ever did. And I make every single do this. It's very important. Because they especially need that push of positivity. So it's so important. It'll change the, our whole perspective of life. And also, we have to maintain and realize that we married our husbands or our wives, for, in that matter, because we saw the good in them, because there were many things about them that we liked, but the Yetzirah gets into our little head and makes us see things differently. Look, look what happens when we're not working on the marriage. I once saw them as an activist. Years later, because the marriage is rusty, I now see them as a busybody. Where I once saw them as ambitious, now they're workaholics. I praise them as being attentive, and now they're possessive. Where once you thought that the spouse was confident, now he's arrogant, or she's arrogant. What was cool, definitely looked up to them as being cool, now they're frigid. What was funny, now is show off. Honest, now becomes cynical. This is what happens when the hashkafa is not maintained and the work isn't maintained on the marriage. When we used to call them laid back, now we see them as lazy. Playful is now immature. Modest is now prudish. Opinionated is now argumentative. Look how we can, our, our perspectives are skewed if we're not careful and we're not working on the marriage regularly. Optimistic becomes now stupid. Quiet is too quiet. Simple becomes boring. Simple was a mile and now it's a chisar and it's boring. Sincere becomes, you're too brutally honest. Smart make, becomes a know-it-all. Trusting becomes gullible. So here's what happens when we're not careful and we start to take our eye off the monitor. Ingredients for a successful marriage. Marriage is about learning to give, to share, care, and think about our spouse's needs and desires. When both people work at it, the marriage can work. Everyone wants to be happy when they marry. You'll be happy when you make your spouse happy. Standing under the chuppah, Rav Desla says, the chazan and kala both want to give. And each one is dreaming of how they can be the giver and fulfill what's behind the shorish of Ahava, which is Ahav, which is to be a giver. 
But suddenly after the wedding, too many people start to think, if I don't look out for my rights, who's looking out for me? And each of the half begins to focus on themselves rather than their partner. But Rav continues, remember the rest of the Pasuk, if I'm only not looking out for me, what am I? And he answers, a narcissist, who only thinks about themselves and their own needs. Because they focus on his thought of Bishfili Alam Nivra, for me the world was created. And he has to remember, we all have to remember, Lola Atzmo Nivra Olam. You were not put on this world for yourself. This world is not about ourselves and our needs. Rather, this world is about the opportunity to help and do for others. Your Ani, rather, your greatness, Rav Desla says, is measured by your Ani, your I. If your I is just you alone, you're a rather small person. If your I encompasses your spouse, it's even bigger. If it involves your children, even bigger. The greater the radius of the people that you care for, the greater you are as an individual. That you look beyond yourself. A successful marriage depends more on being the right person than finding the right person. You working on yourself to being the best person that you can become. So of course marriage is not about keeping score, reckoning who gives more, who receives more. Mature adults can give without tallying points. I did this for you, now you have to do for me. We don't believe in that. A person should be able to express and give love without adding to the debit column. It's great to marry someone you love, but it's more important to love the person you marry. You're in already, now make the best of it. Right? Again, it's great to marry someone you love, but it's more important to love the person you marry. The idea is to choose your love, then love your choice. Marriages don't automatically make you happy and satisfied. It's up to you to make your marriage happy and satisfying. It's about the work that we have to do to put into it. A good relationship is more process of learning the dance than choosing who has to be the perfect partner. The best way to make a marriage work is to concentrate on your spouse's positive qualities and on the positive side of the relationship. So the negative stuff can remain at bay. Yes, in a good marriage, a wife could say he may drive me nuts sometimes, but he's still a wonderful human being with great midos. When the focus is on the whole rather than the parts, the negative won't overshadow the positive. And we have to always remember the positive. Spouses in a good marriage care for each other. They're willing to be unselfish and see the other person's view. And they're not insecure enough to appreciate that there are differences between them. A marriage is made of lifetime of memories. If resentment, anger, and irreconcilable differences have overtaken the marriage, people are only going to remember the negative stuff. There's a beautiful Devar Torah about Yosef at Tzaddik when he tells Paro, seven good years and seven bad years. What was he telling him? Was, Put away for the bad years. Yosef was actually giving a very beautiful mashal for Hassan and Kala. There's going to be rough times. So you've got to archive great memories in your head. So when there are times that are not so good in your life, remember the good stuff. Bring out the good stuff from the archive and the library in your head. And that way, when, there's, when there are stressful times, you can remember all the great memories that you had together. Very telling story about what it means to be one unit. A man, an old man, places an order for one hamburger, one order of french fries, and a drink. He unwraps the hamburger and carefully cuts it in half, placing one half in front of his wife and one half in front of him. Then he takes the french fries and counts them out. One for me, one for her. One for me, one for her. This is going on as other you know, people in the restaurant are watching this. He then carefully cuts it out. He creates the two piles. He takes a soft drink and he gives it to her. She starts to take a sip. He takes a few bites of his hamburger and everyone's whispering online who are waiting to be helped. Look at that poor old couple. They can't even afford a meal for both of them. They have to share. So as this man is eating and he's enjoying and she's not eating, she's just sipping on the coke. People are feeling bad. So one of the other customers comes over and he says, ma'am, can I buy you a hamburger and a, a french fries? No, it's okay. It's fine. It's fine. Meanwhile, he goes back to the line and the old man continues to eat. The man comes back and he goes, I can't handle it. It bothers me so much that your husband's eating, you're not eating. What's going on? The old man had just finished and wiped off his face with a napkin. 
And he asks, so what are you waiting for? And she says, the teeth. They share the dentures. Mm -hmm. Amazing? Wow. Yeah. That's what it means to be part. Marriage makes one of two. That's important. Staying in each other's, involved in each other's lives is critical. Unfortunately, life becomes busy and we pass each other through the hallways and in the kitchen and in the home and it becomes forgetful. So we have to be careful and kind of sort of regenerate that. Rav Miller writes, my Rebbe, married life is a matter of making concessions to each other. That's a principle by itself. It's impossible for each person to do everything they want to do. Even in business, a partner can have it all one way, otherwise the business is going to be run to the ground. You've got to always be making concessions. And that's the perfection that people gain in their characters. I gave a, uh, a and I'm sure you can you know, back me up on this, I gave a major presentation yesterday with a couple hundred people, singles, in, in uh, Long Island. And I asked the question, why should you get married to begin with? Yes, we know it, Peru Maluta Arts. And I said to them, because only through the framework of marriage can you become the best you. There you'll learn to be humble. There you'll learn patience. There you learn endurance when you have to wake up at 3 in the morning to change a diaper. And we have you have to go to an ER. I had my share of those. That's the only framework of becoming the best person. Rav used to tell us, only by rubbing elbows with another person under the same roof can you come to shine like silver. That's what marriage does for us. Seen from that context, it's a laboratory of becoming excellent or seeking or, or achieving excellence in our midos. There you learn self-control. You can't say what you want to say all the time. You can't do what you want to do. And that's what we're put on this planet. The Messiah Yisrael tells us, we're put on this planet because we're here to perfect ourselves. I got a phone call two weeks ago from a woman who watches me on Torah anytime. Corona breaks out. She left her, uh, her husband because she had a bad relationship in Brooklyn. She drove cross country to LA. Didn't see him for eight weeks. They even talked to him, even call her. I said, unbelievable, mind-boggling. Can you speak to him? I said, no problem. He wouldn't even get on, get on the phone to talk to me. Look how bad he can get. Eight weeks, she was alone by herself. It's unbelievable. So, we have to stay emotionally involved and that's important. Keep your eye on your marriage as it were the gas gauge in the car. Don't let it run out of gas. Love can die of neglect when spouses don't tune into the partner's needs. You don't notice sometimes that you've not spoken for a while, you're growing apart. And it's important that we have to keep an eye on the gauge. Care for each other, treat each other with kindness and sensitivity, gift each other emotionally and physically. Obviously, a beautiful story of Rabbi Ali Levine when his wife wasn't feeling well. And he went to the doctor. Very famous story. And when the doctor came out to see her and he says, how can I help? And he answered, our foot is not feeling well. His wife's foot was our foot. It was seen as his. That's the key. That's so important. You have to always remember something. Research has shown that every happy, successful couple was always going to have 10 areas of incompatibility. And it's okay. You can't, you're not going to agree on everything. You're going to agree on a lot of things. But it's not the end of the world if there are things that you don't agree on. It's fine. You have to accept it and understand that that's perfectly normal. Couples must be willing to work together, realizing that neither one is always right or always wrong. But there's got to be something that we achieve called compromise. Try to see the other person's point of view on and you don't not need to necessarily win every argument. Because, as Rabbi Vig Miller would tell us, how many husbands are right now living in basement apartments in Brooklyn because they had to win? And they're eating meal moth frozen dinners. Don't have to win. Nitzachan is one of the greatest travesties. Nitzachan is idea of victory. Is it worth winning the battle in order to destroy something which is eternal as our marriages? We don't want that. Who is right is not important. Who cares who is right? Each person should hear and validate what the other person is saying. Validation does not mean you agree with your spouse, but it means that the other person's opinion is heard. So a practical primer for women. Paying attention. Everyone wants to be listened to and heard. At the end of a long day, you've had a long day with your children, etc. You may not feel like listening to your husband. Do it anyway. It's a kindness and a big chesed to him. Two, be interested. Paying attention is good, but seem sincerely interested in what he has to say. If it interests your husband, it should interest you. Stay awake. 
in order to accomplish the first and second, you may have to stay awake. But many of us are tired, we have jobs, etc. Especially when your children are young. It may not be easy. And if you go to sleep early every night, chances are you and your husband will not be spending much quality time together. Be sensitive to his needs. If your husband likes to stay in at the end of a long day, try not to fill your evenings with too many social obligations and cultural events. Express your affection in words. Yes, even big tough guys need to know that you feel about them, care about them. That's important. Actions are not enough. Expression of your words are critical. Show admiration. And I'm sure it's not an issue in this, in this uh, forum, but even more than our love, our husbands want our respect. Don't hesitate to tell them how proud you are of how they handle their business and their accomplishments at learning. Very important. You finish the Masechet, tell them it's great. I'll make you a seam if you want. Encourage him to share his dreams and help them come true. A system with tax, tasks he doesn't enjoy. Many people, many men hate the shop. So buy things for them, whether it's clothing or ties or shirts, whatever. That shows that you care about them. And be an Ezra Konegdo. If we see our husband about to make an erroneous decision or head down a bad path, it's our job to find a loving, creative way to stop him. I always say to my, my, uh, my guys, if you're going into a business deal and you want to make an, reach an agreement with someone, bring them home and let your wife watch him and he eats dinner. She has an amazing bean in Yasera. Next, don't compare your marriages. Don't look at other marriages. As Hanukh Tala writes, the, how come the only people who are really happy are the people I don't, I don't, I don't know well? Because we don't know what's going on. Everyone's life and marriage and children look perfect to the outsider, but once you get to know them, you find that they also have problems. Don't do comparative studies. With every marriage it has its challenges. Everything may be perfect at this moment, but they may have gone through rough times. You never know. And he tells a beautiful story. Frida and Murray seem to have been the ideal couple. The parents of six lovely children and got them all married to wonderful homes. After they married the sixth one off, they separated and got divorced. All the other mechotanim were aghast. What kind of family did we marry into? Was there peace and tranquility or fighting and frustration? How do we know? They all believed that these kids were marrying into a very stable family. Perhaps these wonderful parents made, sac uh, made you know, sacrifice of staying together for the sake of their children. I know that. I had a client like that. 